Hey guys, Tom here. Before we dive into this episode, I just want to tell you about a few awesome free resources we have available for anyone watching this video. Firstly, if you head over to my website, thomasbrettmixing.com, you can download a free 70 page ebook I've put together called Mixing Simplified. Within this book, you'll find tons of tips, tricks, and advice on how you can go about achieving great sounding mixes in the simplest, most easy to understand way possible. You should get a pop-up asking if you'd like to download the PDF when you first arrive on the website, but if you don't, you can also find links at the bottom of every page or on the store section of the website. Aside from the free ebook, if you head over to the blog section of the website, you'll also find a huge collection of educational articles that I've written over the years for top audio education platforms like the Pro Audio Files, Unstoppable Recording Machine, and Joey Sturgis Tones. One final thing before we get on with the video. In the very near future, me and Max are planning to do some video segments where we review your music. If you'd like us to potentially take a listen to one of your tracks and give you some fairly in-depth feedback and advice on what you can do to improve the mix, recording, songwriting, structure, or pretty much whatever we hear in the track, feel free to submit a link to your song using the Contact Us page of the website, along with your contact details. Every now and then, we'll pick out a few random submissions to include in our upcoming videos. Anyway, let's get back to the podcast. Hey Max, how you doing? Hey Tom, all doing well. A little exhausting, you know, had to demonstrate wonders of efficiency. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel I feel like every time we every single time we start one of these podcasts, it's like, how you doing? Yeah, busy, tired as usual. <laughs> yeah, it's always usual. the same. Yeah. Maybe we should just pre-record one intro and just use it for every single video. Yeah, busy, tired, doing well. Let's get on with it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's get on with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the the good thing is, as I always say, we're we're busy, we have work, so that's the dream. And we're doing our dream job. You, you can't really complain. Yeah, it doesn't come from a point of uh, being unthankful or unhappy. I'm I'm really happy having. I mean, the, the projects are really nice recently, better than before. I I can even say there are also some great expectations for this year in terms of what I'm about to mix. Uh, that said, it, you you like you know all work and no play make, makes Jack a dull boy. That's uh, the thing I I witness quite often when I just analyze my uh, my set of mind and my, my mood in the end of the day. Mm-hmm, it's usually mm-hmm. like, okay, the projects are great, but I'm still like, I just want to lay down and think about nothing. Well, uh, that's a good segue into our topic for today. Um, I guess one of the important things when you're so busy and you have so many different projects going on is being efficient. So being able to work fast enough so that you have time during the day to actually relax or do hobbies, stuff like you're very interested in your cars and work your motors and those kind of things. So if you want to be able to have time after all the mixing, production, recording, all the work we do, you need to be efficient, which is our topic for today. So for anyone new to the podcast, this is the Unscripted Podcast, uh, hosted by myself, Thomas Brett, and my good friend, Max Morton, where we talk about anything audio related, recording, mixing, production, philosophy, anything. And today we're talking about efficiency, as uh, you've mentioned. So just before we started uh, recording this podcast, you were telling me about how you had a band get in touch with you saying, oh, we need a we need our album mixed uh, five songs w- uh, by the 10th of March. And it was a bit of a surprise to you. I think that's a good segue into talking about how 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 do you be efficient with that kind of request? How do you get that much work done quickly and efficiently while still getting good results? Yeah, exactly. It's like just imagine you're uh, you're going to the gym, which I'm not doing recently, unfortunately. But imagine you are lifting weights and you have to train regularly uh, and become better with your technique, become better with your like muscle mass, with your joint strength and everything to lift a, a certain weight. Otherwise, it will crush you. It will traumatize you. You you might even, you know, force it for a couple of times, but then you will be completely smashed. Same thing with job. So you'll get more and more projects to work on. You'll get more and more different uh, cases with every band. Sometimes they'll need things urgently. Sometimes it will be more editing than you expected. Sometimes you will unexpectedly... Uh, need 
to put in extra extra work into certain projects. Sometimes the projects will clash, so someone will have a delay, mm-hmm. someone will have an unexpected contract offer from the label or something, and you will have to do more projects at a time than you expected. So to to manage all that, you got to be that well-trained athlete who has good technique, good schedule. He he knows not only in training, but also in the way that athlete sleeps, eats, spends all of the time. So when you're a professional engineer, well, professional everyone, but we're talking about engineer, yep. engineering here. When you're a professional engineer, you got to make sure that everything you do in your life uh, works as one single well-tuned mechanism to help you make those, um, you know, do those projects efficiently, finish them in time, never make mistakes because it's very easy to make mistakes when you're overworking. Mm-hmm. You can easily forget a fade out or, you know, proper fading. You, you, so there are certain routine things you got to make, you, you got to turn into habits, mm-hmm. I'd say. You got to assist yourself by being, you know, that's, that's actually a great title from Unstoppable Recording Machine, if you think about that. Recording Machine. Not in terms that you're not a human being and there is no more art in it. No. It's in terms of that you got to be that machine that makes no mistakes, that follows the algorithm. Mm-hmm. In terms of how you name things, in terms of how you approach mix prep. Mm-hmm. So you got to make sure that your mix prep, for instance, is organized so that um, the band sends me the tracks and I say, give me a couple of hours, I'll do the first ra- first stage of mix prep and I will write you back with information, with questions, with probably with corrections, with, with something. So I will probably check the naming of the tracks. Uh, is there a tempo information? Um, do they all uh, begin at the same point? So are the, all the tracks in sync? Mm-hmm. Can I actually start organizing the tracks? Are there tracks that are clipping? Are there stereo tracks collapsed to mono and vice versa? And all that kind of stuff. So in the end of these, two, let's say, two hours, maybe even one hour of initial mix prep, or I'd even say prep for a mix prep. Mm-hmm. So the very, very first stage uh, <clears throat> that's the quality control of the incoming tracks yeah so you gotta have all those things imagine that you are not just the car enthusiast in the garage but a, a car manufacturer a plant there should be no chance of error or imagine that you are the airplane um company you you gotta like everything can go wrong with that kind of complicated machinery, right? But luckily, thank God we don't have we don't witness too many crashes mm-hmm. because there is a well working system. There's been a lot of uh, mind put into organizing things so that any error is almost um, self exclusionary, mm-hmm. self exclusive. That's how you got to organize everything when it comes to your sound engineering. Make sure that the errors exclude them th- themselves. Other- otherwise, you instantly stop at that point automatically. Not because you've noticed it, but because the project is organized so that, I mean, your workflow is organized so that you cannot proceed when there is an error. You mm-hmm. cannot proceed. And that's one of the most important things regarding efficiency, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Well, it... Yeah, it's it's in- interesting that you mentioned like uh, URM and unstoppable recording machine because back in the day they used to do a lot of uh, they had a, I think they had a, uh, a whole course called speed mixing for example and Joel Wanasek was a, a big fan of working fast and efficiently and they made a whole big deal of it out of back in the day and I remember back then I was still in a perfectionistic kind of mindset where I'd spend ages and ages and ages doing stuff so when I saw Joel Wanasek saying stuff like oh you can mix a song in two or three hours and get great results, I'd be like, oh, surely he's not giving his uh, full effort or attention to the song in that case. He's, he's not putting in enough work, which is just a totally wrong way of looking at the whole thing. As, as we've talked about multiple times before, if you know what you're doing, less 
time spent doesn't mean lower quality. And as you say, like the the real key to efficiency when it comes to mixing is the preparation. I'd say, uh, you say the preparation and the pre-preparation. For example, with something like a vocal, right? If you have a super, super, super dynamic vocal, let's say, and you try and just dive straight into your mix and just use a single 1176 to try and get that whole thing under control. You dial the 1176 in according to the chorus and it sounds just right. You have that right, that perfect tone, that perfect balance of attack and that uh, tightness in terms of dynamic kind of non-fluctuation. But then you go to the verse and you have a completely different vocal sound because the 1176 isn't hitting anywhere near as hard as it was in the chorus. So by preparing beforehand, by spending literally like five or 10 minutes, like doing something like some basic volume, pre, pre effects volume automation, maybe add putting a limiter that's just limiting a couple of the, the highest peaks in the chorus, random peaks here and there, maybe doing some slight additional automation. You can make that whole uh, process simpler so that when you put the 1176 on, you're getting a much more consistent result. And you're not having to yeah. worry about all of those things, which would take you a long time to, to fix during the mix and will take you out of that process. You're in the process, you're being creative, you're EQing, you're compressing and all that. And suddenly you've got this big problem that is unsolvable unless you go back, you take steps back. And taking steps back yeah. is what takes you out of the process, takes you out of the creativity, slows you down and starts you on your overthinking journey, you know? And actually, vice versa, it works uh, sometimes the opposite way because some of the bands are they split the lead vocals into vocals verse mm -hmm. vocals bridge vocals chorus mm -hmm. and and sometimes those are um, equally loud dynamics wise so it's just a rock song and he sings well in his regular voice or in her regular voice throughout the song so I would not need too many tracks I, I'd, I'd prefer to have one it makes mm. me think quicker yeah so you 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 have uh, one side of the story and not another side. So make sure that it's super simple. Everything that you do not need, make sure you optimize it. Mm. If you have three tracks, you can optimize into one in in thirty seconds. Definitely do that. At the same time, if you have a track that you need to pre-automate, because you know you will do it. Maybe you can even do it without listening. I actually prefer doing that without listening yes sometimes when i see certain things like okay this track is too too quiet i will boost it like 10 12 db i will look okay this one the the, the riff guitars are too hot they're like minus 3 db i don't need them to be that i mean the distorted guitars mm -hmm. i will have to um, probably notch them down 9 db or something to to have the the balances i prefer to mix with i will do that and usually it means that the first time i press the play button i'm doing way less of the job mm -hmm. same with panning I, I import the drum tracks i will instantly just pan them really quickly overhead 75 75 toms 30 25 70 uh, everything else let's say centered like hi-hats th minus 30 right plus 60 yes yeah, of course it's the, if it's the drummer perspective again i would probably really quickly listen and even watch watch overheads to make sure that the hat is to the left right is to the right i will do that mm -hmm. and in fact you see i'm try <laughs> when i'm when i'm talking about it i'm speaking really fast <laughs> as much as as fast as i can We're trying to be efficient because, with uh, the podcast <laughs> the thinking yeah the thinking i um i put into this project uh i put into this process is, mm -hmm. is really fast and straightforward yes and that fast and straightforward is what gets you going yeah so you will have fast and straightforward to a certain point when you do the act of uh, creation, the creative act, so you will stop and think, okay, what kind of reverb do I want here? I want fat um, saturated plate. You get a fat saturated pla plate, you dial it in, that's the act of creation, that's when where you contribute as, a, as an artist, as the engineer artist, and then you do 
the uh, following straightforward things. You you do maybe some um, multiband compression on the vocal group and you send all the reverbs and delays there so that it would slightly go up in between the vocal phrases, for example. Mm -hmm. You would choose that because that's what you want. So, uh, and, and that leads to the next thing that I guess is very important for being efficient. You gotta have a bunch of spells in your pockets. So instead of uh, thinking that there is infinite an infinite amount of ways you could go, yeah, go to you always have a bunch of them. Yeah, a bunch of them. It doesn't mean two or three. Let's say you you want to have ten, and ten will make you very diverse, very very creative as a mixer. You will never really repeat yourself unless you need to repeat yourself. Mm -hmm. So again. Um, Joel's idea of mixing a song really fast is great and it's working. I guess many people, myself included, didn't really accept it, accept it in its original form. Yeah, me too. Because we know, yeah, because we know that uh, in most times you you get a project you need to mix, but in fact, what no one knows and the band doesn't know that you need to mix prep it and not just mix prep it in terms of regular mixing, but you need to edit stuff, you need to maybe even re-record stuff, you need to do a lot of things before it starts sounding right. And you cannot mix poorly recorded tracks fast. Mm -hmm. So one thing is when you get that great quality tight guitars, and let's say even they're not re but the, the DIs are so good that you slap any plugin on them and they sound right instantly. Same thing with bass. One thing is that if it's a good bass or a programmed bass, another thing is that it's when the bass is really sloppy and and you have to tune that bass and you have to gate it and you have to replace lots of notes before it starts sounding right or, or you won't be a even able to mix the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of protest I felt because that's a very important disclaimer everyone has to make. Well, Otherwise, so many people will be frustrated it's about, if they try mixing fast. It's about so, getting, getting the purpose of the whole uh, thing right. So... You don't mix fast for the sake of mixing fast. It's the the, the, mm -hmm. the time isn't the, the the goal. You know, it's not about try and get a mix done in two hours. Try and get a mix. That's not the po the point. The time yeah, is true. the time. The mixing fast is the thing that aids the real goal, which is maintaining focus and creativity and seeing the big picture without getting too caught up on tiny details like cutting 0 0.3 dB at 5.7 kilohertz like that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's right. the that's the point of the time of doing things quickly doing things quickly so that you can just focus on on getting the best creative results that's going to impact uh, a listener the most in the best way possible which takes us back to to crystal algae which we always talk about so crystal algae you mentioned like reducing track counts to make things manageable you know if you have a vocal that's split a lead a lead vocal that's split across five tracks that's just a lot to think about. You're going to have to worry about copying over all your plugins, making sure plugins are the same or linking plugins or whatever. There's just too much to worry about for myself. And I think you'd agree. We prefer to maybe just take all those vocals, make it into a single lead vocal. If there are any tonal changes, for example, someone might, they might have recorded the, the chorus vocal on a slightly different microphone, for example. You can still just do some slight EQ to make to to get it to sound more like the other vocals, and still get them all on a single manageable track. And that's what CLA does, and he and what his assistant does for him. So that even if they've got three hundred tracks, they're reducing it down to forty eight tracks, or what, or however many tracks he has on his SSL. And maybe CLA isn't even hearing the track until it's been fully prepped to perfection. I know that the stuff he's getting is good anyway. If he's working with someone like Howard Benson or Mike Plotnikoff or whatever, yeah. it's going to be good anyway. But then his assistant is taking that and taking it and doing the kind of stuff we mentioned, clip gain on vocals, you know, making sure things are consistent, making sure samples are accurate, key spikes, whatever, if, if he even uses that stuff. But so that... CLA can then go in and mix a song in an hour and make it sound chef's kiss, you know? <laughs> exactly. And and he is the uh, the heart of the process and uh, the, the most um, expensive and most valuable part of the process. But 
the most uh, little steps were done prior to him. Yes. And uh, and that's, again, the cat car factory thing. So imagine one thing goes wrong on the previous stage. It's almost like a meme, you know, there is uh, a factory and lots of guys are standing and like one guy attaches part A to part B, another guy fastens the nuts, mm-hmm. the next guy applies some paint or I don't know, some loop or anything. Just imagine one guy makes a mistake all the time. Then you, you, you're getting junk in the end. Yeah. Definitely. So uh, efficiency, uh, efficiency is about getting consistent quality. Also, uh, efficiency is about saving the most valuable resource everyone of us has. Time is crucial for us as human beings, as living creatures, because we cannot really replenish time. Time is also crucial for our clients, especially those who have deals with labels, who have plans to shoot music videos and everything. Also, time is important because the the, the faster you are, I'm not talking ridiculously fast, like two, three hours, but let's say two, three hours of pure work, then some revisions, and you get the full turnaround time for one song within two days. Mm-hmm. that's just good healthy results for just mixing if mm-hmm. we're talking editing probably longer but in general what it means is that band's expectations will be completely adequate they won't be waiting for too long which means they won't be too um i'd say nervous about the the, <laughs> the mix they're receiving so if they wait for a month most likely the the result will be negative and the whole thing will be overthought on both ends, on yours, because you will be mixing forever. You would be mixing forever and on their end also because they would be probably expecting... I think we were talking about it before in in the Perfectionism podcasts, how how much bands uh, develop demo ETs and things like that if they're waiting for too long. You don't want that. And and of course, because uh, how else can you earn a living as a mixer? You got to just deliver stuff regularly. That's yeah. the truth of it. That's how you that's how you will actually live forever. Well, of course, we all want to record a multi-platinum hit and, you know, get our royalties for, for the rest of our lives. But that's not how reality works these days anyway. But, but the thing is, if you if you watch any documentaries of like, uh, our favorite artists we we talked about this in the in the perfection one w- with black sabbath um but and, but if you watch documentaries with guys like the the biggest pop stars in the world like taylor swift or ed sheeran like i'm not sure if you've watched any of these documentaries because it's really maybe not your style but if you watch these documentaries yeah, from haven't. from the perspective mm-hmm. of just analyzing how they work and how fast they work a lot of these big super hits you know they come so quickly in the studio because these people, they they have objectivity in terms of quality. They like Ed Sheeran's a great songwriter. He's written so many hits for so many artists, and himself, that he can just write a song, come up with a melody. Yeah, that's the chorus. Move on. Oh, here's a verse. Here's a pre-chorus, and you have a song done in a day or two, or at least the the core of the song. And then they spend a, quite a long time on the production and the mixing and all that stuff. But so even at that level, even at multi-platinum hit level, there's this this degree of efficiency and working fast and maintaining the creativity without focusing too much on the, the minute details. Let's think about it like that. Uh, if you need to spend a lot of time, and if it's a hard task for you to do something within the range of what you have to do as a mixer or as a producer... It means that you're still learning, which is perfectly fine. But, I mean, how to get a good guitar tone? Depending on the tone you're seeking, you have a mic or two mics, a cabinet. You put the mics in the positions you prefer. Set up the amp. Maybe a couple of pedals and you play it. You record a few takes, double track, some layers. You get a great track. It's a matter of few hours. And maybe there is some editing involved. You will spend a few hours editing. Maybe your assistant would do editing for you. 
that's a great way actually to improve efficiency. That's, uh, uh, that's probably another thing we'll discuss. So what I mean is that every step, we can just pick any step in terms of mixing or mastering or editing or programming uh, software in instruments or uh, vocal production, anything. It's, it's a process that just takes a very reasonable amount of time. Nothing is like a huge trip, like a, a few days trip, uh, a journey to the land of guitar amps and cabinets and you'll spend a good day trying all the microphones. Man, if, if even someone does it, it's more of... doesn't represent how things are done. Usually, uh, you gotta visualize what you want to receive in the end, and then you follow there, instead of just standing in front of the void, looking into the void, seeing all the options you might or might not have. Because these days you have countless options, you have plugins, which means that you can just never uh, start recording. And if you just, if you, if you search for a tone forever, you will never start recording. Yeah. You know, so uh, what I mean is that uh, efficiency uh, comes naturally with time as you're slowly uh, getting rid of all the habits that, uh, all the, I'd say all the bad habits, everything that gets in your way. Mm -hmm. Everything that you don't have to do, really. You, at, at a certain point, you think, okay, sh should I really do that? Should I really? It's like that classic Andy Snip story where when he told, when the the one he wrote about guitar tones, that all of a sudden he realized that getting that classic multi microphone configurations with condenser mics and room mics and everything sounded less clear and less desirable than a single SM57 on a Mesa cabinet and yeah. 5150. And, and I think that moment of clarity is what we got to seek always to improve our efficiency. Well, I, I was just thinking of like a little uh, analogy in my head of like, if you think of something like like a modern modern metal, right? You can have a modern metal song, which is really simple, arrangement-wise, production-wise. Maybe just, if you think of... Uh, well, it's not really modern anymore, but if you think of like uh, Lamb of God, right? Lamb of God, uh, arrangement-wise, it's double-track guitars, bass, drums, vocals, no synths, you know, at least at least in the in the the OG <laughs> Lamb of God albums. Mm -hmm. I haven't listened to their recent albums, but you know what I'm saying. That kind of a metal setup is very basic. You know, there's there's although they're working hard on tones and all that stuff. There's not much stuff that you can overthink and, and really screw up in that kind of setup. On the other end of the spectrum, you can have like a, a modern metal band, band which has amazing, huge amounts of post-production effects, synths, hundreds of layers. So you've got, on one hand, you've got a song that might be 30 channels of, of tracks, and on the other hand, you've got 300 tracks. Now, uh, what's to say that the 300-channel uh, song is going to be a bigger hit or it's going to be more successful, you know? compared to this really basic thing. Maybe this one's going to be extreme, extremely uh, popular and extremely successful simply because it's a better song or whatever. And that's not to say you can't do 300 channels. I'm just saying, like, in modern metal and, and a lot of uh, modern recordings, this stuff is so overthought. You're like, okay, let's add a synth, let's add, add, add this synth, add this synth, add this arpeggio, add this synth bass, add this blah, 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 to the point that everything is layered to oblivion. And then you have like 500 channels of vocals with harmonies, layers, doubles, yeah. whispers, scream tracks, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, although there are a lot of engineers and producers who can do that very well and efficiently, for me, that's the kind of thing that can lead to like this, this, this trap of overthinking tons of things. You know, because the longer you're spending yeah. on a track, uh, getting all these additional elements in there, the more things are going to be like, oh, maybe I should change the guitar tone. And it just, it, it can snowball. Whereas if you've got a simple arrangement and you're just focusing on the basics, it becomes so much easier to just get it over and done with, you know? Yeah, that's why you stem things that are very secondary. Like if if you have that 500 tracks project, you... Usually, I usually spend some time uh, stemming. Let's say there is a bunch of uh, background synth tracks that are so quiet and they just complement each other. 
I would probably just high pass them really quickly to make sure that there is no dirt down there. Maybe I would just do like, you know, 10 second EQing. And then I will balance them into a stem. And I would probably freeze them or and hide them somewhere or even remove them from the active project. Mm. So that I would have probably 90 tracks, maybe even 50 tracks. And then I would probably even stamp those tracks to 30 tracks. In the end, we're thinking, in a, a, we're, we're thinking about just a few basic mix elements that matter. What these mix elements consist of, it's another question. Just imagine you have one snare, just one snare. Now imagine that some crazy engineer has recorded that snare with 25 microphones and those are really tiny microphones. So one only records the rim, another only records the, uh, the upper head, another one only the lower head without the snare, then another one for the snare separately. And that's super important to process them. Are you sure you will get a better snare tone in the end? Maybe not. Most likely you won't. Same thing with guitars. So if you are very, if you are lucky to get one microphone, just right. Why do you need? Uh, in fact, I I remember uh, when working with real cabinets, at least, I had a huge quality boost one day when I just started recording them as one track. Mm -hmm. I, I just I just mixed them right into my inside my RME total mixer. And what went into the DAW was just one track, N never mind the amount of microphones I used. And that made me so happier, especially when you have a quad tracks, uh, track and a few solos. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> compare six guitar tracks to 18 guitar tracks. Well, you've got like six Quite a difference. five or six microphones that then you have to make the yeah. decision. You're just delaying the decision to later. Okay, once it's now recorded and in the DAW, yeah. you have to make all of these decisions. How am I going to balance them? You know, how am I going to pan them? And then you have to EQ, but, you, you, you feel like you need exactly, to EQ exactly. every single one of those five microphones but also, separately also or whatever. How you, how you treat them within the project. I mean, if it's just one guitar track and you just pan them like this. Mm -hmm. Now imagine you have three guitar tracks on each side. Mm -hmm. So two guitar tracks, you can just combine them into one stereo track. Without any groups, without anything, just get one stereo track. It's your riffs. Done. Mm -hmm. Or you have six tracks and you group them. So you have seven tracks, six tracks and a group. Mm -hmm. And you do the processing of the group. The project looks much, much heavier. It's yeah. heavier on your brain, especially when you have a lot of stuff going on. That's what I'm talking about. So efficiency... And that's how any large, any 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 complicated task is done. You gotta split it into smaller, into easier subtasks, and only <clears throat> that's how that that's the only th way you can actually get great results with larger projects. At the same time, I just keep thinking how the bands I love, their biggest hits, are super simple songs. And I'm sorry for talking about Boomer metal again that's just time proven so yeah. that's what i can that's what i'm competent about talking yeah so judas priest they had so many great albums before british steel but what made them really huge massive number one metal band british steel breaking the law metal gods two songs that are super simple in terms of structure in terms of arrangement, two guitars, vocals, drums, simple drums, yeah. short songs, yeah. barely any solos, and that worked so much better. It's like There's tw a tw 20 on, tracks, yeah. 20 tracks and yeah. something like Breaking the Law. Exactly. You know? And you could easily go with, if you record the drums the old school way, I imagine that you could easily just use 16 tracks to fit all the all that recording onto these mm -hmm, tracks mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and mix it within probably 40 minutes or so mm -hmm. 40 minutes maximum yeah. and uh, that's how the biggest hits are often made doesn't mean that that you cannot make a super hit like you know bohemian rhapsody 
that's the antithesis to what I just said. But usually, usually, especially for the perfectionists like us, it's a good thing to sometimes to think about things like uh, breaking the law or paranoid. Yeah. Of Black Sabbath. Things like that. There are simple uh, that are that can fit very well into your brain. Think about ACDC. Most of their stuff is like mm -hmm. very, very, very simple, yet great. Great. So if I'm if I'm dealing with uh, projects that are not like that, I'm trying to structurally simplify them until they become that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, try and thing, turn you know? it into, force it into being something like that for the sake of your yeah, sanity. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And of course they can roll <clears> back <throat> if something is absolutely needed. Although it doesn't really happen, by the way. So if mm -hmm. I had 200 tracks, I stamp them down to 30 tracks. I I don't really remember uh, any requests from the clients saying, you know what, the synth, like that little square wave synth that goes beyond everything else in the chorus, could you please re-EQ it a little bit? Yeah. No one ever said that. So that's a very, very nice, efficient way that will not, will probably not uh, make things worse for you. Yeah. No one will say to, hey, you know what, you stamp those things and we want all them to be present in your project, mm -hmm. in, in your project, so don't do that. <laughs> yeah. No one, no one asked me for that. So by all means, by all means, if you have problems with, especially if, you know, some people, myself included, we, we, we tended to overcomplicate things and I try to make sure that every little synth um, would be there with all the processing and I should have... Uh, an instance of pro Q and in every, in every background synth instead of the built-in EQ on the channel of Cubase. Mm -hmm. uh, and only recently, maybe like five years or so, I realized that I'm just playing, it's my mind playing tricks on me. I just didn't, didn't analyze it. I was just acting blindly, ruining my workflow. Well, you know, there's there's this saying that, that Christians have, what would Jesus do? I like to say, yeah, what, yeah. What, what, what would Chris Lord Algy do? And yeah, if you right. watch any of his videos, I mean, with the kind of synth sounds or these, these whatever kind of production elements that I might spend a long time going in with a pro cue and then, okay, cut a bit of 500, boost a bit of 1.1K, whatever, like really detailed work. He'll just bunch them all together into a single stereo group, stick them in the SSL, boost 8K, done. <laughs> pretty pretty <laughs> <Yeah>. much. <laughs> you know? You'd hate yourself doing that. You'd think, okay, I'm just cheating. I'm stealing money of the client. It should work really hard on these tracks. They paid me for working hard on these tambourines and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> tambourines, yeah, yeah. For yeah. spending five uh, hours uh, mixing a tambourine. One little one little thing here I'd like to add, what I, I like doing, if I, let's say, have a bunch of synth and they go into a group. So uh, if I feel like the synth are almost there, they do not need extreme processing on every track, I would probably uh, do the top-down mixing. Mm -hmm. So I would slap something like uh, a Pro MB, a multi-band compressor that would also EQ all the synth as a stem. Mm -hmm. And I would only exclude the sub synth from that um, uh, group. So the sub drops, some deep drones and everything would go to a separate group. But all the, the rest of the synth will go to the stereo group. I would apply the Pro MB. I would tweak it until I really like it. I might do some, just a tiny bit of uh, stereo widening in the treble area, in the upper mid area if needed. Maybe a tiny bit of soothe if I feel like, okay, it's, it's there, but sometimes it's a little harsh, for instance, right? And then I would go into individual synth and I would quickly high pass them because there is sometimes unwanted rumble down there in the synth i would probably high pass them i would probably slightly pan them just do a few little things but it would probably spend i would probably spend 10 minutes or so doing yeah. that which is the thing i was going to mention with in, in that kind yeah. of situation it's not about just oh just dump them all in a single group and then boost high end and no like if there's anything that sticks out to you for example one of the synths definitely mm -hmm. needs a severe high pass where you're getting rid of maybe all the low end you know 
then obviously you do that kind of stuff. But the the the, the point is you're focusing on the primary stuff first. That's your priority. And then you're fixing these little details. But you're not going in and doing like a hundred plugins worth of like crazy moves on every single one of these tiny channels that make up a 300 channel song you know like that will yeah. never ever end you'll never finish that song <laughs> so another rule for efficiency i'd say would be demo uh demo approaches demo moves are totally fine for your uh finished product uh like you want to use a demo guitar tone do it you want to do super fast mixing like like what you what you said do it i used to only mix demos like that mm -hmm. then i realized that i'm losing a lot of a lot of what i liked in the demos i'm just losing it my my mixes didn't sound as good as my demos mm -hmm. especially in terms of guitar tones back then i remember mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh we had like i i, I used to my my friend back then he was a really he was so so obsessed with guitar amps and guitar cabinets and he used to say max every time i hear a demo of your song the guitars are great a anytime i hear the mix of your song guitars aren't that great overprocessed and though. it was not the, the most pleasant thing to hear but he, he was right he was probably right yeah because i just didn't care about you know <laughs> completely butchering the guitar tone with all the surgical eq and choices that were not uh intuitive those choices were analytical and you cannot really analyze when things keep escaping from you and the way our hearing is tailored the way our brains are wired our hearing is always very adaptive in terms of frequency curves it adapts yeah. really quickly it's like you know imagine you're holding a hot cup with the one hand and a, a cold cup with another hand and then you quickly, you know, put this hand on, on the hot cup. Mm -hmm. It feels or you feel yeah. different temperatures with yeah. two hands. Same thing with your ears. So when you are over cueing things, especially things that have very complex harmonic structures like distorted guitars or cymbals or sibilants or orchestras, actually, that's why it's very hard to EQ orchestras. And usually you, you would like to avoid any surgical EQs on strings and brass and choirs and everything mm -hmm. unless it's something very specific mm -hmm. unless it's some you know, artifact that you can see on the graph mm -hmm. so it's better not to play tricks with the adaptiveness of your perception no i agree i agree you need to not people need to not underestimate the power of gut instinct and just that initial and it's, it's it's as blatant as yes or no. That should be the question that goes in your head. Yes or no. It shouldn't be a percentage. Um, it's 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 almost good enough. But blah blah blah. No, you shouldn't go into that much detail. When you hear something, you either like it or you don't. If you don't like it, scrap it. Try something else. If you like it, move on. You know, just move on. And if there's any slight things that you need to change, do it with EQ or whatever. But do it all quickly. Do the whole thing quickly because. Uh, your brain, as you say, your brain adapts. And it's like, I, I've, I've, you know, I do I do a lot of songwriting. I write a lot of songs I'm, and I sell a lot of songs to people. And you've helped me out with the mixing of a lot of these things. But when we originally started doing them together and I started sending you the mixes, I told you, I said, I'm, I'm trying to get into this kind of uh, 60s Beatles or ACDC mentality with my songwriting. Just the core, get the core right move on and sell the song so i'm not spending days and days and days layering synths and layering all these things i'm just trying to do high quality good simple songs basic songs and selling them and, and earning a good living by doing that and it's been working very well so far um and there's times when i'll i, I told you this the other day like i i get a a client asking for a, a k-pop song you know and k-pop is quite a uh, complex kind of instrumentally quite complex they have tons of samples tons of these kind of things and it's like if my mum always used to say um a job or work always expands uh to fill the time available you know oh yes so with with this k-pop pop true. song for example i had like 10 days to to do it right if i'd spent 10 days working on an instrumental i could make this massive magnum opus with 500 channels and stuff you know and maybe it I, you don't know how it's going to turn out maybe i'll get 
uh, crazy about the whole thing. You know, I get I start overthinking about sounds. I'll start referencing too much or EQing the kick too long, whatever. So what I do a lot of the time is I just, even though I have 10 days, I left the whole thing to the very last day. And some people might mm-hmm. say that's stupid because what if something, what if you don't get inspired or whatever? But constantly the thing I always find is when I work fast and I have that, that you could call it stress, but I, I call it excitement or adrenaline, you know, of, of having to do something and get something done in a day, pretty much always it ends with good results because I'm not overthinking any aspect of anything, you know? So I started with, with nothing on the 10th day, uh, searched on the internet, uh, looking through different samples that could maybe inspire me, loops, uh, and I, came, I found a bass loop and I'm like, oh, that inspires me. So bring in the bass loop and then working fast, that bass loop inspired something else. And it's the thing we've talked about before about spark. You know, you get a spark and then that leads to another spark and another spark. And before I knew it, within three or four hours, I had a complete instrumental finish that was uh, good. You know, I'd say it was objectively good and it inspired lyrics and inspired melodies. So I wrote the the, the verse and the pre-chorus melody literally in three minutes and it was done i'm like yeah that that inspires me it's good and i just kept on going from that momentum the adrenaline and you also get the feeling of satisfaction when things are just going well so you all for for every single thing you do you're you're saying yes or no yes i like that no i don't like that move on find a different sample okay yes i like that that leads to something else blah 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 blah. before you know you've got a whole song finished sent it off to the client they were completely happy doing right now Actually, what you're doing, you're describing a very uh, algorithmic approach to art, and it's nothing. There's nothing bad about it. In your case, it's like if then, if this yeah. criteria is met, then do this. You know, it's like I imagined someone walking in the dark, uh, and there are lanterns set all around the area, and you're just moving from lantern. So you you approach a source of light, and you instantly see a few other sources of, of light in the distance and you just go to them. Yeah. And also I imagine that, in fact, uh, the CLA is the kind of guy who's, I just imagine that he's so fast, uh, I imagine him escaping that monster behind him. So his quick mixing is his ability to escape that monster of, you know, getting, getting your ears <laughs> effed up. Yeah, uh, with uh, with adaptiveness to weird frequency curves and everything. There is no time to overthink. You just move, move, move forward. And what you said is also moving forward instead of overthinking. So we are, in a way, we are escaping those monsters in the dark area. Yeah, just following. I I think it's just me playing too many horror games. No, but <laughs> it's it's true. the the whole thing of the whole thing of uh, in my case that monster is time. I have I had yeah. I literally had one day to do this thing. So. Uh, one day, if you say one day is uh, like 10 hours of work time, if you also include that I'm, I need to sleep, eat food, spend time with my wife and and maybe relax a little bit, then I have 10 hours. So I'm I'm running away from, I'm escaping this this time. The time is coming to get me and I just need to make progress. So you talk about an algorithmic yeah. process and if this, then that. Yeah, uh, in my case, you're forcing the, the algorithm into not being able to do this thing of, if this, then overthink, over EQ, overdo this. You just can't. You're eliminating that whole thing out of the question. So to where it's purely pick a kick sample. Is it good enough? Does it pass the 50% threshold where it's close enough to what I'm looking for, where I can just fix it with some tiny EQ later? Yes. Okay. That's my kick drum sample. Move on to something else. Okay, that's my blah, blah, blah sample. It's good enough. I can fix it with some tiny EQ later. To the point that before I know it, I've got an entire song, an entire structure, and the mix, and the same, and I applied the same process when it was, it was a demo mix, so it wasn't like a full, full blast, uh, a full-on mix, but same kind of thing. Like, I came to mix, mix vocals on it. My wife recorded the vocals really quickly. Um, because it was just a demo, someone else was going to re-record the song afterwards. But I said, "Oh, screw it! I'm not even going to bother with like a, a full vocal chain. I just threw CLA vocals, you know, the waves plugging on there, and just yeah. got it to as good as but, it could be, and, and sent it off." Yeah, everyone should bear in mind that behind this approach, uh, years of hard work. There are years of hard work because you have, you probably don't have horrible samples. 
on your computer, right? You probably your wife knows how to sing. So it just would not work if you still haven't established your favorite plugins, your favorite chains, your favorite samples, yeah. your favorite uh, ways to work, and also certain techniques like proper singing techniques. And add to that that we are standing standing on the shoulders of our uh, predecessors in a way because Wave CLA Vocals is a great plugin. It's simple. It, that it, is it, designed for yeah. exactly for that. You just slap it on the on the properly recorded track and you get a good sound. And especially for the demo. And actually, I heard the demo. It sounds. I, I think many people would call it a mix. So it's it's a great sounding demo. But that requires work and everyone who is not there yet it's perfectly fine it just it just needs some time in any case you will have to invest time before you really become efficient efficient even us at this point although we are at this point relatively efficient i would say we're still learning i still know i have lots of problems to overcome to 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 really become efficient there's one trick i wanted to share <laughs> uh, so let's say I have a week of job ahead of me and I have tasks some of them are urgent some of them are not so urgent and with the not so urgent tasks I'm playing a little mind game so for instance okay I don't I don't want to edit vocals today I really don't want to sit in front of a Melodyne or something and just listen to the vocal takes and do all the tuning but I'd really prefer something else maybe maybe i do the mix prep for the whole album of songs just the whole album of songs today i will just do the mix prep so i i always find among the tasks i have i find the the tasks tasks that i that is least dislikable for me today <laughs> that way i procrastinate from an other tasks but i still do something good mm -hmm. so i still move forward I'm just not doing things I would not like to do today. But but you know, one other thing I'd say on that exact topic, I agree with you completely. Obviously, we kind of compartmentalize things. These are the jobs I like doing. These are jobs I dislike doing, blah, blah, blah. But there is also this thing, I, I've noticed it a lot recently, which is when I have a lot of work that's lined up, things I have to do. For example, these past couple of weeks, I had some big orders of lots of songs, like 15, 20 songs that I have to write, you know? So every day I'm having to write like one or two songs. Ideally, I should be writing two songs, but I procrastinate. I'm like, oh, I just want to do one song and get it over and done with. But a big element of this whole thing of doing tasks you don't like doing is you do get this this boost of serotonin or adrenaline or something when you finish the task, even if it's a task that you hate doing. And it can really help motivate you to, to go into the next task. And I found that these last couple of weeks, if I just, because often what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll mess around throughout my day and in the evening I'll start doing some work. Oh, okay, I need to do some work, you know, and I make it this big deal. But the thing I've found is if I just get on with the work in the morning and, you know, it's that classic thing that people say of, oh, if you just start the day by making your bed, then everything else becomes a lot easier because of that boost of, you know, start the day by making your bed, by tidying your room, and then you feel like you've accomplished something, you feel like you've finished something, and that leads you to the next task and the next task, and, it, and they become easier as you do more, as you get more inspired and more motivated. And I found that if I just get the, the work done, the hard work done, it's a lot easier for me to do two songs in a day than if I just leave one to the evening or whatever. So, uh, you know, just a bit of a tangent there, but... It's it's when you work fast and you just get things done, you do get a boost of uh, confidence and just morale, you know, and that can affect Absolutely. your whole whole yeah. work life, you know. In fact, we are. I don't know if uh, I don't know the the correct English word for that, but we are uh, we are as if we're training animals to jump into the hoops, you know. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we do to ourselves. On one side, we, we, we explore ourselves, how this approach works with me, how that approach works with me. Okay, I'm getting the boost of serotonin by accomplishing tasks. I have, this, I have a similar little trick. I have a TXT document with, with the things I have to do today. And as soon as I remove, I, I finish something, I remove a line. Mm -hmm. And removing a line gives me a very strange... Uh, 
moment of satisfaction. <laughs> yeah. Same thing though, and, yeah. And, and and in most days, when I can clear, clear out all the lines, it's just I, I go to bed happy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, and of course we are, in, in fact, we are distorting our, ourselves in a way, right? We, we create different distortions and deformations in our psyches, but those are useful. Those are useful because if you think of it, um, what else would you like to do in life? Building something, creating something is a good thing to do. Mm-hmm. So if we are efficient at building and creating something we're actually better people yeah so it's not bad to you know to do these experiments with yourself Mm -hmm. training yourself jumping through hoops of fire that are nightmare clients (laughs) yeah 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 um to be honest max i think that's a pretty good place to end it i mean we've we've kind of come to a very positive kind of final note on the whole topic of efficiency and the effect it has on us and all that stuff. So, so we were quite efficient today. Yeah, I mean, pretty much exactly an hour. So that's that's good. That's efficient <laughs> when it comes to, to us and podcasts. That's efficiency you know? right there. Because we could talk for three hours or four hours if we wanted, but we're really trying to be efficient. And we've <laughs> we've done our mental pre-preparation. We've prepared our projects, which are our brains, before going into the whole podcast thing to, to be quick and efficient. So... It was yeah. great talking with you, uh, Max. Until next time, I Likewise. guess. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah. See you next yeah, time. Yeah. Talk then. soon. Bye. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>